Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Good today's webinar, Right Opening 2015 Awards Entry, hosted by Sean Grant, longtime New South Wales Councillor and a judge of the AMI Awards for over 10 years. This webinar is supported by our webinar partner, Redback Conferencing. My name is Sarah Anderson, and I'm in charge of the AMI's communications and content. It's now my pleasure to hand over to Sean Grant to tell you a bit more about the awards and introduce our special guest. Great, Sarah, thank you very much uh, and welcome everybody on the call or webinar. Um, as you see there, a uh, bit of background on the awards, I'm not going to read uh, all the points on the slide but suffice to say they've been around for a while and um, the categories and the, and the sort of process has evolved over time but um, we wanted to have this webinar today really to, to talk through how it works um, from a, a kind of behind the scenes perspective. The categories themselves, um, there are quite a number of categories and uh, as, as there are a number of elements of, of marketing, um, it does give uh, you know, every, all organisations a lot of sort of scope and, and opportunity um, for the various uh, programs and things they're running. The criteria, um, these are the most critical things and we'll probably be coming back to these later in the call at, at different points. Um, in terms of judging, this is obviously what drives everything and then um, when it comes to judging each individual category, it's down to the interpretation of, of these things but all judges will, will obviously allocate their scoring according to the breakdown of percentages you, you see on the screen. Uh, but as I say, we'll probably be talking about those and there will be uh, no doubt some, some questions on, on all that side. It's like being back at school or university, how is this going to be marked? Um, the next slide uh, is how to enter and as you see there, there is a, um, a platform that the AMI runs um, off the website um, that's a, a sort of portal and you upload um, the various entries and things to it. Um, Sarah and, and others can take questions on that um, and we also welcome uh, comments and, and feedback on how people are using the platform. Um, you need to obviously, as the points say, they create a profile in advance and then uh, tell your story. Um, in terms of timing, uh, the schedule is now on the screen, uh, kicks off in March, nominations then close 29 May which is the, the critical date for you if you're thinking about uh, submitting an award. Um, then we do the judging from June to August and then there's the, the gala presentation. Following that and it's a slight change this year, we'll be holding state awards presentations after the national awards. We have held state awards presentations before the nationals in prior years um, but for various reasons there's, there's been a change to that, uh, not least of which some states have been pretty light in some of the categories. So uh, again we can give you some more background on that and, and might get to it later in the call. So uh, without further ado I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, firstly I'll, I'll kick off uh, telling you a bit about myself. I've been a counsellor for um, something like 20 years. Um, I head marketing for a law firm currently, Dibs Barker. Um, I'm also pretty involved in, in industry things uh, and prior to that I, I've had a background in professional services. So I've spent time with Ernst & Young, Alan's Arthur Robinson law firm, uh, URS Corporation engineering firm and various others. Um, so I'll be obviously facilitating today. Uh, I'm delighted to have uh, a panel joining me and you can see them on the screen on the slide at the moment but I'm going to go to the first of them and that's Jane Clark uh, to tell us a bit about herself and also Jane if you could just mention uh, your fabulous uh, successes from last year. Over to you Jane. And we're not getting any sound. Jane? I might move on. I think we've got a technical hitch. So hello, hello, we'll hello. Oh, Jane, are you there? Yes. Yes, we can hello. now. Ah. <laughs> Did you take a bathroom break, Jane? <laughs> no, no, I've been here. I don't know what happened there. Um, oh, yeah. So, so I'm, so I'm throwing to you. If you could give us a bit about your bit of your background and also uh, to talk us through very briefly your success last year. Sure. So I own a small marketing agency called V Marketing. Uh, we're based in Brisbane. Uh, I've got 15 years experience marketing in Sydney and Brisbane and at various sectors uh, and I established V in 2010 because I was a mum with small 
voice and was desperate to use my brain and thought, well, there's got to be other people like that out there. So we've got five consultants who are all mums, but they've all got senior level experience and we just do a project that interests us. And um, so we specialise in the small to medium business uh, space. And um, Greg Dennis is a dairy farmer who came to me uh, a couple of years ago to say that his 80 year old farm was on the line because Parmalat, his processor, was offering him a price uh, below production, 25% below production. So he said, look, my grandfather set this, my you know, grandfather set this up in the 1930s, so this is do or die for me. I'm going to invest uh, significantly in setting up a processor on site. And basically I was to create a brand and get the word out there about this milk. So we had eight months to create a name, a brand, and build up Greg's uh, profile, I guess. And I'm not sure how much detail you want to hear about the actual campaign, but basically uh, the first thing I did was walk into Woolies and Coles and look at the, the, the fridge of milk. And, and it, to me it was a wall of white plastic with very bland labelling and there wasn't... Uh, it really allowed people, consumers, to go in and, and pay a dollar for a litre of milk without any connection to the producer or the farmer. So I thought the first thing we've got to do is say to people, there is a family, a farmer behind this milk. And so we concentrated our efforts on building up a profile of Farmer Greggy. We used a lot of visuals in the label itself, uh, his fields, the cows, uh, the, the background mountains in the scenic rim, uh, which is south of Brisbane. And we uh, got Greg out, that farmer Greggy out in the media as much as possible and luckily he, he's a bit of a media task so that was easy. Uh, and we used lots of visuals about with his family on the website, his, his grandparents, black and white photos from the, from the years gone by, his kids to say, look, this is a farming family. There is, there, there's, you know, there's a family behind this, this uh, milk. And we just got in lots of events, the Brisbane Eka and um, you know regional events, and, um, and and Facebook was huge too. And we we posted reg Farmer Gregory himself posted regularly to take people on a journey on on building the processor, what this meant for him in in laying the whole farm on the line. And in the end, uh, it was a fantastic uh, success, and we had. And as milk is uh, a perishable, we needed to have a large number of people willing and able to buy the milk day one because obviously it's not going to last. So they had to milk had to sell, and so it was it was a great success. We had um, milk was selling out within an hour in, in the various uh, outlets, and within I think two weeks we doubled our stockers. And Greg was reaching full production within a month, and. Today he is stocked in over 200 um, outlets across South East Queensland. So, and the farm Terrific. is saved, I guess. Yeah. Yes. No. Well done. And um, uh, the the marketing awards side. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll ask Jane a couple of questions in a sec. Um, but I'd like to move to some of the other panelists. But just to finish on Jane, um, one at national level, new brand product and service launch last year, and then went on to take out the main prize, the the big prize of program of the year. And uh, Farmer Greggy's talent um, was evident uh, at the the ceremony. He was um, he was front and centre to, to receive the yeah. award with Jane. So that was fantastic. So Jane, thank you very much. Um, I'll ask you a couple of questions in a second. So stand by. Sure. So I'd like to move on to Joe Painter. Joe, uh, your side, a bit of your background, and also your successes in uh, the AMI awards. Um, thank you, Sean. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Oh, beautiful. Um, well, look, I, I guess we've been entering the AMIs for probably close to 10 years. Um, the origins of our agency are, I guess, a little bit unconventional. We uh, take what I guess we call a multi-channel approach. We've got over 30 today, I think it's about 35 staff. Um, and our approach to marketing is very much, you know, looking at that multi-channel, uh, the multi-channel sort of tactical executions as well as strategy and, um, you know, bringing in things like social and digital as well as branding. So when we put forward our 
um, submission last year for which we put a number of um, a number four, but we won for for digital marketing. It's very much what we I guess would take would believe is the new approach to marketing. So it's leveraging that multi-channel approach, basing it on very sound research and strategy, um, and really utilising a lot of metrics and um, I guess anal analytics through the process. But key to I guess our approach both to the AMIs and the awards themselves is you know is really trying to set a new benchmark for the campaigns we do for clients and uh, typically working with challenging budgets sometimes we have big budgets which are fantastic but most of our campaigns you know you are always working with either challenging communities or challenging budgets so um, it forces you to I guess think clever and and, and uh, deliver campaigns that just have that bit of extra thinking in them yeah, that's great, Joe. And um, awards you've won, um, I know they've been mainly in the government space. Can you tell us a bit about them? Yeah, well, I guess I, we, we are, whilst I guess it's, as an agency, we do focus a lot on corporate and government. So the awards we tend to win um, are in both the, when last year it was around local government, um, some in the tourism industry. We've won several awards. We, we enter awards, I guess we're lucky because we have a big digital division which has just taken out a few international awards. Um, our PR agency, uh, again, we, we enter awards for the Public Relations Institute and win those. And, or have had the I guess benefit of winning some of those, and then again with the marketing side of the business. Um, so yeah, I guess as an as an integrated agency, we have some of the benefits of of being able to draw on both the skills, but also the successes of and the strengths of each one of our three pillars as an agency. Um, and that positioning within government um, has been really it's been a really great decision for us to focus uh, with so many agencies competing in the retail FMCG space. We've chosen to you know, specialise in corporate government and B2B, which um, to date has been a good decision, but let's, I guess we'll see what the future holds. Very good. Thank you, Joe. And our third panellist I'm just going to move to is Lynette Gannam from Bayer. Uh, Lynette, um, same, same criteria if you want to give us a bit of background and um, also tell us about some of your wins. Sure. Um, so I'm here today representing Bayer, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Bayer is a very large organisation and um, we did have two wins in the AMI Awards last year. Um, one of them was entered by one of our agencies, Synchro Marketing, in the, the loyalty category um, and that was for a program called Accelerate that targets um, steps. And we also won an award um, in the Insights category. Our crop science area won that for a product called Ever Go Prime. Um, so it was the first time we'd entered the awards last year by ourselves um, and what I mean by that is rather than agencies entering on our behalf. So one of the challenges that we have as a big organisation is how do we mobilise a diverse set of marketers um, working on multiple campaigns to enter awards such as the AMI. So um, what people... Bayer is primarily known as a pharmaceuticals company, but we do a lot more than that. Uh, we actually focus on the health of humans, plants and animals. So a lot of our brands are household names. So for example, in the healthcare space we have brands such as Barocca, Elevate and Caniston, in animal health, Advantage, Advocate and Drontal. So we do crop protection um, and we also do ethical and prescription medicine. So we're a very diverse and complex business. So the way we actually go about mobilising our marketing team is we run our own internal awards and what we've found um, has been really helpful is actually mobilising them to enter using the AMI criteria. So that helps us compare all the campaigns across the business. Um, but as you can imagine, we receive over 40 entries into our own internal awards. We have uh, our own panel of judges. One of them is independent. Uh, and our marketers vote on the finalists and the judges determine who wins. So our motivation really is about driving marketing excellence and focusing on that continuous improvement and having the learning and the knowledge exchange. And we believe that that is really important to drive our marketing outcomes moving forward. 
Very good. Thank you. That's great. So that's our three panellists. Um, I'm going to, for the next five or ten minutes, ask each of them a question or two. Uh, and just to sort of uh, unpack some of the, the interest around their involvement. And then um, the, the plan from there is they're going to quiz me a bit on the judging side and uh, we'll also then um, take any questions that, that people have, so please keep questions coming in. Um, so I might um, flick back to Jane, um, and that's, that's our full panel there on, on the screen. Jane, from your perspective, I mean, you're obviously a, a, a small agency. Um, you've got your five mums. How did you decide on, you know, the, the sort of the resource commitment, I suppose, around um, submitting for an AMI award? Uh, and, and also, you know, I know Farmer Greg is not a particularly large organisation, Scenic Rim Milk. How, how were those decisions made? So I guess having started in 2010 and pitching myself or positioning myself as a, a sort of senior marketing expertise at a small business price, uh, we really don't spend any money at all on marketing or promotion ourselves. So I thought, you know, I'd worked on this campaign for Greg and it was a great success and I thought, well, it's now or never. If I ever enter an award, uh, this is going to be it and I thought and I knew that it was a significant investment in time and I, I wrote it myself uh, I, I am a writer as well that's, that's uh, corporate writing my background as well as marketing but uh, I, I just poured my heart and soul into this uh, submission it was the first uh, time I've entered um, but I just thought geez if I can even get to the Queensland level this has got to be great for, for my little business because I've been taking on other mums and I really want them, there's some really wonderful people working uh, in V marketing now and I just wanted to grow the business slowly and I thought out of everything that you can do to promote a marketing business, winning an award like this would be it. So I, I just devoted the time and, and the energy and got Greg involved and, and yeah, it turned out well. <laughs> More than well, I would say. <laughs> Program of the year last year. Very good, Jan. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's good to hear. And um, just a follow-up question to that: Are you seeing results um, at the moment? Have you seen results and pickup? Is there interest in, you know, amongst other potential clients in V marketing? Yes, it's it's. Look, I've always I, I've always been lucky in that I've, I've always had plenty of work that's gone absolutely berserk and. You know, I've, I've had people ringing me saying, can you do a farmer Greggy for me too? I had an oyster farmer contact me and wanting me to, to turn out another farmer Greggy. Uh, so, yeah, business is great. And, and I really, uh, it's crazy, but I, I should really leverage the awards a bit more. But, oh, I've just stuck the logo, the award logos on my website. Uh, and uh, but I'm, I have noticed a marked increase in inquiries uh, through that website and just word of mouth as well and I haven't really done anything apart from putting it on the website so um, that's been brilliant. That's great. That's good to hear Jane. Thank you. Mm. Um, I might flick back to Jo um, and given that you're, you've worked quite a lot in the government space, um, a question about the material um, that you know, government are, are providing as, as part of the submissions. Have you had any challenges around approvals and sign-off and government stakeholders? Um, I think that's actually one of the biggest challenges when working with government and also corporate clients. Um, we had a, an amazing campaign we did last year for one of the banks and uh, unfortunately we, were, we haven't even been able to talk about it um, because of, it was a, an internal project um, and it just wasn't feasible or even practical to, to take that to market in a, in a sort of a, an award sense. So yes, yeah, certainly when uh, um, one of the things we do at the, even at the commencement of major projects, particularly where government's in involved, we might even flag with them um, that we, we look at this campaign and we go, well, we think this campaign uh, has the capability not just to be successful but to be a potential award winner. And we'll flag that with the client at the very beginning, make sure that you check if they're open to the potential entries um, down the track. Uh, and if they are, or even if they're not actually, to be honest, because we would always set KPIs and metrics, but we start 
um, we we approach every project with, you know, as a potential award winner project, um, and and that's part of I guess approaching everything with that the sense of making it best practice. But it is also having our team really focused on what is setting up the uh, the criteria, the benchmarks, the KPIs, and the measurements, so that you can actually bring forth from the project those important outcomes and outputs um, that are essential to, to your success in, in winning awards like the AMIs. So um, certainly for, in terms of time, we might, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very organised in terms of the award calendar uh, and we would be working on award submissions in various forms well ahead of the often the opening date. It's not always, sometimes they're late but largely because some clients might take up to a month. So my strong advice for those uh, people who are, are taking part in this webinar, if you're working with government corporate clients um, and even possibly small businesses, they can be very slow and if you've got multiple stakeholders, uh, you may have to go through very various uh, iterations of your submission, um, so be prepared to have at least two to four weeks for that process, which does mean uh, you know, working well ahead of the, often even the opening dates of award programs. Very good. And, and Joe, just a follow-up to that, I mean, you've obviously worked with numerous clients on numerous award submissions. From the AMI, from the perspective of the AMI submissions you've made, mm -hmm. what would you say is the sort of average resource time that you need to put into a, a winner? Look, I think the, the to be honest, the more effort you put in, the better your outcome. I think you, the, the, critically you've got to start with a good campaign. You've got to be quite, um, if you're doing a lot of work in an agency or even if you're in an organisation uh, like Lynette's, um, Lynette's, you know, I thought it was interesting that there are literally dozens of campaigns that could potentially go forth. So you need to be, you need to be editing, uh, be prepared to edit your own internal processes and come up with two or three and be realistic about the time commitment. Um, we, again, a little bit like Jane, I'm, a, I'm an ex-journalist, so we're blessed in that we've got people on our team that are very good writers uh, as well as designers. So, um, And you also need to be, have people coordinating the different components. So it is a big time commitment and my strong advice is always to be selective. Make sure that you're, if possible, you may be able to enter the same project in more than one category and if you think you've got a realistic shot, I think that's a good strategy because it's certainly a time saver. Um, but also be aware that you know, unless you might have to make tough decisions, unless you feel you've got an extraordinarily good chance, um, uh, my advice would be focus on the uh, the submission that's going to uh, have the best opportunity. And and that's also respectful to the judges. Uh, I've sat on on the other side judging as well, and uh, you, you know you do want to be looking at the best of the best, not. Uh, a submission that people have just thrown together. It's, it's both a waste of the agency or employer's time but also the judges as well. Yeah, I tend, to, I tend to agree with that from the judging perspective. You do get some campaigns that are clearly sit in, say, the sponsorship space and they've suddenly appeared in digital as well because there's a digital element to them. <laughs> exactly, it's a, yeah. It's a pure cut and paste and in some cases they've even forgotten to change the name of the category. <laughs> So, and, and this is the other thing, you've got to be, we spend an awful lot of time reviewing the, the submissions to make sure that they that we have addressed every single selection criteria and, and gone beyond just that. It's not just the what, it's the why and the, the outcomes. We, uh, the AMI is very focused, marketing is very much not just the process but the outcomes. So, um, and this is something that the, I think the broader industry is starting to understand. Uh, so yes, it is it's great, it has to look great, important to have you pretty creative in there, but ultimately you have to be able to demonstrate you've made an impact and to explain why that impact matters. So that's where having a good writer, if you've got somebody you can bring in, it's a great idea because they can often ask you the tough questions about, so great looking campaign, but what did you actually achieve? Yeah. That's good, Joe. And um, we're sort of advancing merrily into the next bit, which is um, questions around the judging process and also um, how to how to uh, sort of uh, develop and and submit uh, winning entries. Um, but before we do that, um, Lynette, uh, back to you. Um, just a question, I suppose, when you've got a whole lot of campaigns available to you and you've got a whole lot of award programs, including your internal ones. 
Um, why did you choose AMI versus other award programs? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. The reason for us is the AMI in particular really focuses on that link of objectives, a link back to objectives and the strategy. So um, it's not just about the execution or the, the creative output. It really makes our marketers focus on what was the issue that they were trying to solve, what were the tactics that they put in place, but more importantly, what value did it create? And we find for us internally what that is doing is really stopping our business and helping them think about um, what Joanne said, not just what happened, but the why we actually did what we did. And that's really good because it's helping all our marketers um, understand how to develop campaigns in a consistent way and it helps us challenge each other. Uh, some of our biggest challenges as well, um, um, you know, corporate being slow, yeah, of course corporate is slow. And one of the things that also happens is we're also very fast in marketing these days. So everyone does their campaign, they've moved on to the next thing and there's not a lot of time to look back and actually learn about what we've done and really take into account what is it, what made that campaign great, what was the essence that made it really good that we can take that learning moving forward. Uh, in terms of the challenges with our marketers, I totally agree on the reviewing submissions and editing. It is really hard, marketers are passionate about what they do, so it is really hard for them to actually summarise what they do. And so we find that um, wordiness and length and people wanting to show a lot of stuff is always an issue. So we're trying to educate back on that. Um, also, you think it's an easy thing, but actually clarifying objectives sometimes and what the challenge was can actually be quite difficult, especially for established brands that have been out in the market a long time. So it's really good to, to go back and rethink about those and how it links to the outcomes. And one of the other challenges that, that we've found as well, which is interesting I think in terms of um, the AMI's approach is, you know, ongoing campaigns versus a launch campaign versus a birth campaign and how do you actually measure that and how does that compare? And one of the things that we can do at Gaia because we have so many different categories and different campaigns, they're all at different stages, is actually comparing them across business can be quite challenging. So I can only imagine um, what that's like as a judge at a national level as well. Yeah, thanks Lynette. Um, and just by way of an amusing aside, before we get to the, the questions and the, and the judging side, Lynette, um, I'm a, a man in my 40s and um, hair loss is, uh, is becoming a bit of an issue. Um, would you just mind telling everybody about um, the consumer insight win that you had and, and uh, <laughs> the, the, the certainly. Um, so this was a campaign that was done for the rural market, and it was for um, treatment for cereal fungus fungicides, so seed treatment. Um, and what the campaign really focused on was um, in the crop space, you can get bald patches and you need something to treat that to, uh, to help. So um, what the team did was a lot of market research and a lot of insight um, to link what is a very functional outcome to an emotive outcome, which is, a, which is um, men's um, baldness and relating that back to, to the crop. So why that campaign was so successful is it took a very technical message, um, made it fun, but also made it very relatable. Um, and it moved a category that, you know, it, it's chemicals, crop chemicals, chemicals, into a much more emotive space. But what was also great about it, because it linked back to the problem and also clearly linked back to the benefit that was being solved, was that it could be taken to the technical space it could um, be taken to our CSR programs. So the guys at a field show did save for a cure 
and let um, the baldness aspect back to the products and, and raising money for a cause. Um, but it could also be taken in store and it cut through. So in a category where you know there's a lot of rational product benefits, it really cut through and was memorable. So it was a great campaign um, and one that um, the Bay Crop Science team, I have to say, that worked on it, um, really put a lot of effort into understanding that insight. And um, in terms of short storytelling, yeah, there was a little bit of concern about, you know, talking about baldness, but um, the guys were very clear around what the insight said and how that connected back to their target audience and the results um, shone through. <laughs> yeah, no, Lynette um, was certainly very engaging from a judging point of view too. <laughs> got, a lot of got a lot of attention. It was very good creative. Um, so I'm going to now throw to questions from our panellists um, and we might rotate that around. I see some questions are coming in um, from the audience as well, which is great. We'll get to those in a sec. Um, Jane, back to you. Can I start with you? Do you have um, a question or two on the awards judging process? I did in, in respect to being a smaller business which doesn't really have a, a profile at all in the industry and when I decided or when I was considering entering the awards I, I sort of did uh, hesitate because I thought well I wonder you know what chance I've got as an unknown marketing agency up and busy uh, compared to some of the larger corporates and, and well-known agencies so I guess um, well now that I've won it's obviously possible so how do you judge or compare a small business entry like mine compared to the larger high profile uh, campaigns which probably have you know, really impressive budgets and how do you actually compare in the same space? <laughs> um, look the short answer is with difficulty. Um, the longer answer is from a judging perspective it's really trying to put aside individual opinions, biases, um, brands you might have heard of uh, versus brands you haven't, and also, you know, um, looking at the heart of a campaign and and how how it came about and the results it achieved, and and relating it back to I guess um, the the criteria which we were talking about earlier, you know, the the issue at hand, um, how it was approached, um, the metrics applied, uh, and the, and then the overall success. So um, certainly, unlike I suppose some of the advertising awards. We're not just focused on, on the creative, if you like. Um, it's mm -hmm. about strategy and it's about value achieved, return on investment, all that sort of thing. Um, and, and, you know, bringing all of that together, I, I would say from Farmer Greggy's point of view and, and your, your win last year, Jane, the story that came across pretty clearly was the campaign you'd, you'd entered was business transformational. You know, you, you had a farmer that was going bust, um, that was being you know, um, really sort of uh, badly treated from a, a pricing point of view by a very, very large um, buyer and um, he, he'd gone his own way and he'd, he'd started a business and, and it had been marketing driven. And, and as I say, that, that story res really resonated and therefore beat out a lot of very well-known, you know, national and international brands as marketing excellence. So, so as I say, um, to summarise all of that, the, the, the judging side is really to, to look beyond budgets, um, you know, well-known brands uh, and also I suppose the expectation because when you, when you look at a brand like a, uh, let's say for example a Qantas or a, a Ford Motor Company, you know, you would expect excellence, you would expect a high level. Um, mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is, is look at, um, you know, programs that that at all levels and and put them on the same footing if you like. Mm. Okay. We've just got a question from Jill saying we've got a small team of three and small budgets. Are we going to be able to compete with bigger agencies and teams? That kind of follows on from that and it sounds yeah. like the answer is yes. <laughs> so Jill, um, yes I can absolutely assure you of that. I would also say and, and Jill's obviously not one of our panels, she's, um, she's listening in on this. Um, I would say still focus, as, as Joe made the point, on a good campaign entry. You know, you, you want to be making sure you hit all the criteria. You want to make sure it looks good, that it's well written um, because, as I say, we are looking for marketing excellence and, and therefore you need to have excellence in the submission as well. 
But as Jane is, is proof of, she wrote the submission herself. She's a small agency. And, and Jane, from, from my recall of, of what you submitted, you know, it, it, was, it was an excellent submission, but it wasn't sort of over the top in a million different creative executions and, you know, a, a, a big ad that had been all over, you know, national TV or anything like that. Um, you know, you told the story and, and you had some creative to go with it and it was very well laid out and presented. So that, that's the point I'd make. You know, we, we're, we're judging according to the criteria and we're, we're also judging on what we're reading, what we're being told and, and how it's presented. Sean, could I ask a question? Um, I'm keen to hear your, maybe expand on that point about marketing excellence. Um, you know, we know how rapidly the marketing industry is changing and uh, the, you know, the prevalence, you can't go anywhere to any conference without hearing about social and digital and, um, you know, the, the, the rapid evolution of those platforms. So can you maybe just expand on how you, how you as a judge interpret marketing excellence and what, what do you look out for? What are some of the things you look at and go, well, that's really innovative and, and hence that's excellence? <laughs> that's a big question. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. No, no, no. Pre appreciate the question. Look, probably in two parts. Um, firstly, what is excellence? We would say excellence is, um, is the results side and, and you know, well, it, it's good marketing done well that's achieved the results. So if your avenues to market have been around social media, digital, experiential, uh, whatever, whatever devices you're using, if you've achieved excellent results, that, that to us would constitute excellence. Um, by the same token, if you've used highly innovative things, um, and whatever they are, you know, if you've, if you've split the atom and you've, you've um, you know, you, it's, it's a highly creative approach that you've taken, but you can't show results and you can't show metrics and a return on investment, unfortunately, we'd, we'd, um, we'd mark you down. Mm. So, and, and just, just looking, and I mean, if I flick back on the slides, I'll just go back to the criteria slide so you can have a, a picture of that. Um, what we're talking about, you know, if, if you had something that was highly innovative but you didn't have good results to back it up, mm. you may get a brilliant score in the issue and you may get a brilliant score in the solution uh, and your marketing outputs might be terrific, so your, your sort of campaign materials and all that sort of thing, but your outcomes will be sadly lacking. And then the other thing to look at, and 30% and bear in mind of our weighting, goes to outcomes that contributed value. And what we're talking about there is long-term value to the organization and the brand. Again, you know, if you can't tell us the story around what the future looks like and how you've set yourself up for it, you're going to be pretty lacking. So as I say, I, I would counsel that, you know, if, if, if it's highly innovative, it also needs to be highly successful, mm. if that's an answer there. But, but certainly in terms of innovation, some of the, the campaigns we've seen that have, that have won have been very, very innovative. And innovation is also related to using small budgets effectively. Mm. And if you, if you look at, for example, Jane's submission and Farmer Greggy, you have pretty small budget and, and some really good marketing. Um, and also good marketing in, in a space, as Jane was saying, she looked at the wall of white in the supermarket and it's all white plastic and there, there was no connection to the, to the farm and, you know, there, it, was, it was pretty bland stuff. She, she's, she, I think, and Farmer Greggy almost single-handedly have turned around that category because if you go into supermarkets now, you're seeing a lot more branding around milk and there's A2 and there's everything else. And I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not attributing it purely to, to Jane and, and her efforts, but I'm sure she's made some sort of impact. Hmm. So there we go. That would be my answer. Um, so that was a question from Joe Lynette. Do you want to have a go? Uh, yes. So I'm going to go the opposite, obviously, <laughs> being in the big corporate space. Um, so what about the brands that are not challenger brands, the ones that are well known and established? How do the judges um, approach this? Because they may be well known and there may be some bias there. Um, Yes, exactly. So, as I said before, the aim of the judges, and, and certainly when we induct new judges, we're very clear to outline that all preconceived ideas and experiences should really be, be left at the door before the judging begins, because you know um, we're all we're all in the marketplace. We're all we're all experiencing the big brands and. 
we need to leave that stuff behind because we're talking about marketing. We're not we're not just talking about you know communications, and we're not just focusing on the big end of town. So um, it, it is about you know making sure that we, we put everybody on an equal platform, um, and you know then then it's about again the the, the results and the success. So if, if a big brand has had uh, strong success and they can they they can show by way of metrics and return on investment and everything else that they've achieved it and they put it together in a in a very slick you know impressive uh, submission then um, they'll be a winner and we've had plenty of, of of wins in the past we've had wins by oh, to to run through the list Coca Cola Amatol and Qantas and the biggest brands in Australia have have picked up awards. Um, so as I say, big brands can do it. We're trying not to be biased towards the smaller players. Um, but as I say, it's, it's trying to put everybody on the same footing. Thanks for explaining that. All right. So there we go. Um, we actually had a call this morning saying um, what happens if it's a new campaign and they actually don't have the figures on IOI, should they still enter? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a tough one to answer. I, I would say if, if there's no story to tell around outcomes, results, and also uh, the, the, the value built, I would wait a year because you know you could, you could spend a lot of time, energy, and, and effort on a submission, and if you don't have a complete picture, you know, you, you're, not, you're not meeting all the criteria, and I, I would say it's, it's premature. And I must say, over the last couple of years, we have had quite a few really interesting looking campaigns that, you know, unfortunately a lot of effort has gone into, and, oh, sorry, campaign submissions, uh, a lot of effort has gone into them. And we're just unable to give them the high marks that it looks like on the surface they may deserve because they don't have that, the outcomes. Um, so as I say, we'd, we'd almost love to send them a note and say, please submit again next year. So, so as I say, I, I would say you, you need to be telling a good story. Sure, sure. Um, we've had another question come through saying, um, how confidential is my entry and the numbers that I put in there? Um, we assure absolute confidentiality. Um, it does obviously go to the judges, um, but the judges do, uh, do uh, agree to that confidentiality. Um, and so, so as I say, it's, uh, there's some assurance around that. I can also share that we do. We have had the situation in the past where judges have potentially been involved in the same industry or a similar industry, and then um, a call is made on whether the information is shared with that particular judge, if in fact they're still appropriate for the category. Um, if they are still appropriate for the category, we have had situations where that judge will be left out of the judging of that particular entry, and it'll be left to the other judges. Um, to, to fly solo on that one. Um, so as I said, it, it really depends on the scale of the conflict of interest. And, um, and yep, so, sorry. So, um, so, so that's a, a bit of an explanation there. Um, the other thing to say is in terms of the, the stuff that's communicated around a campaign, certainly the confidential aspects are not communicated, but we do, um, once, once campaigns are winners or there are, there are materials and, and things done around the, the award submissions, usually it's an executive summary um, that, that is publicised if, if somebody, if a campaign wins. And that's usually, or I think always, signed off um, by the, the, the company or, the, or the, you know, the proponent that submitted the campaign. So we wouldn't be publishing anything or we wouldn't be circulating anything without prior approval except to the judges of that category and obviously it'll, it'll stay confidential to the AMI. Okay. Um, we've got a question. Um, can I get any feedback about my entry? Um, yes, to some extent. Um, we do try to, uh, I, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the AMI is open to um, telling people what the judges' comments were. Yeah, that's correct. And there's a, there's a follow-up there. Um, I'm, I'm more involved in the front end of the judging process and I, I don't have much to do with the, the back end and, and the administration of it. Um, so, but as I say, that Sarah's confirmed that the AMI do provide judges' comments. And that's, that's to non-winners. Um, to the winners, when the, the, um, the winning entries are announced, um, there is often um, some reference to what the judges had to say about the entry. 
So winners certainly get quite a lot of feedback, um, and winners obviously get the the very pleasant feedback that they've won they've won an award. Um, often there are um, special mentions in categories. So uh, and again, if the special mentions feature in the um, the award ceremonies, um, there'll be some some um, background as to why they were a special mention and uh, what the judges had to say. Um, there isn't, I have to say, uh, a sort of a report that's, that goes back to, to entrance. Um, we just um, haven't, haven't gone there in the past. But as I say, all of the categories uh, judging panels produce comments on each of the entries they receive. So those are available to people. Sean, could I just jump in there and give, again, just a little bit of advice to entrants. One of the things we do with every award submission is, because um, obviously some aren't successful, uh, we'll always have a look at the, the successful entries um, and they're often available, you know, whether it's on the, the AMI website or, or at the awards ceremony itself and compare, um, you know, that campaign to our, or what we can, what we know about that to our, our submissions and, and I think that's a really important learning that, uh, you know, the more, just entering awards isn't, shouldn't really be the game, it, it, sorry, the aim, sorry. It's about becoming better both as an agency and using awards as a way of fine tuning and building an, IP, an intellectual property base. But also if you're going to put all that effort in, you know, trying to become better and better at putting the award submissions together and the best, well, one of the best ways of doing that is looking at your peers and competitors and finding out why are they winning awards and what are they doing potentially differently that you can leverage off. Yeah, Joe, that, thank you. That's, those are very good comments. And I fully endorse that. And, and from a, a corporate marketing perspective, I would also make the point, and I'm sure all of the, the panellists would agree, you want to be leveraging that material as much as possible, both externally and internally. Absolutely. Very good. Um, so uh, back to the panel, Jane, we haven't heard from you for a while. Do you have any more, any more questions from your side? Um, I guess, you know, you talk about Farmer Gregory and being a business transformation and I sort of thought about, you know, is this campaign worthy of an entrance, an entry? Uh, so I guess how do you decide just how good your campaign is and whether or not it's worthy of an entry? And then also following on, we've had a participant question saying, do you compare metrics between entries, like will a bigger percentage of gain or ROI achieve more weighting in the scoring? Okay, so let's take them one at a time. Um, Jane, how do you decide if you've got a worthy entry? I would say, um, firstly, you know, if, if, you're behind, if you're behind a campaign um, or you're consulting on a campaign and you've developed a campaign, etc., get, get some outside sort of, take some outside soundings and advice. Um, I, I think, you know, having been, having, having won entries myself uh, years ago, you know, it's it's about also how, how it feels. I mean, you'll know what's going to be impressive and what's not and, and whether the results are impressive and whether you've got the materials and, and the, the the innovative stuff to be to be telling a good story. Um, so I think that's probably the, the first part of it. Um, I do know though, having obviously been inside organisations where we think we've had terrific marketing, and um, to Joe's point earlier, you know, we've we've always developed things on the basis that they might be award winners. There are times when you know you sort of look in the mirror and you say, well, to be honest, we're not going to be up there with um, you know uh, the, the campaigns that have won in the last few years. Um, we just haven't had. We've we've moved the needle a little bit, but we we think we probably should have moved it more, or, or the campaign is in early days, or whatever. So therefore, it's going to be a, it's it's probably not going to be a very compelling story. Um, so as I said, I think it's it's about that, um, and it's about getting some advice from fellow marketers, contacts, um, and seeing how the story plays. Mm. Um, and then it, obviously, it, it is about what you can say if you if you've got a fabulous campaign, but everything's confidential, um, and and you, you need to and and you're worried about submitting it. Um, you know, for example, if you're working in an agency and the client has said our, our, our metrics and things are not to go anywhere, even though, as I say, we, we at the AMI assure, assure you of confidentiality, if you can't use that stuff and you can only tell half the story, again, that might influence whether you put in the resources. So I think there's that side. Um, to the question that Sarah raised, um, 
are there direct comparisons made between metrics? Um, and I think the question revolved around will bigger percentage gains ROI achieve more weighting in the scoring? Look, yes is the answer to some extent. Um, when you look at award submissions, the results of the submission are only one component that we look at. Um, and I, I draw your attention again to the, the splits between the, the various categories and how the judging is done. Um, but you know, if, if two campaigns were exactly the same in all aspects, but one had achieved you know, bigger gains than the other one, well, absolutely, then the one with the bigger gains will, will score higher. But you know, all campaigns are different, and you know, so, some of the earlier sections around describing the issue and, and how the campaign was formulated and the innovation applied, et cetera, may mean that the scoring in those areas is, is stronger than a campaign that's got slightly higher gains. Um, it, it really just depends on the overall entry. So, so I wouldn't say there's a direct comparison. And certainly from a judging point of view, um, we, we're not stacking up each individual campaign and purely looking at the ROI uh, and, and making a comparison around that. It's, it's a bigger picture than that. Um, so we've had another question from Jane. Joe, any other advice from your side or, or questions for me? Um, well, yeah, look, I'm interested, Sean, in uh, again just going back to the the sort of things you're looking at when you're looking when you're comparing submissions. Um, again, smaller agencies often have to make that decision: do I focus on the look of the campaign? Do I focus, or, sorry, of my submission, or do I focus on the content? Sometimes you have to choose between the two. Um, in advertising, there's a big focus on flashy graphics and videos. To what extent? Does that influence or shape your decisions? Having that, you know, the the, the dazzler videos and, and those type of additional content that you can supply. Yeah, look, I, I, um, I think we've sort of touched on this a little bit earlier, but Joe, it's, to explore it as a as a topic in itself, I think it's a very good question. Um, we look at the whole picture. Is is the short answer? And you know, if there is flashy campaign materials, that's great. Um, but it's it's certainly not the be all and end all, and I think um, sometimes you know you you can get amazing campaign materials that you know uh, are definite golden lion uh, candidates that wouldn't actually do particularly well in the marketing excellence awards because we're looking at strategy and we're looking at you know the the campaign as a whole as well as the results etc. So it's not just about the shoot the lights out you know fireworks mm. display. Mm. Um, and, and as I say, but by the same token, the shoot the lights out fireworks display, if it's achieved stellar results, it's had a fantastic sort of genesis. It's it's true. It's showing demonstrating innovation and marketing excellence that may also win. So it's the same sort of answer I was I was giving earlier. Um, I would say if there is a deluge of creative, um, sometimes from a judging perspective, it is difficult to go through all of that. And if if it's if it's not backed by a strong entry, I hate to say it, judges are people too, it can get a bit frustrating looking at all the creative because you feel you really should from a judging perspective and really, you know, just just feeling like it's it's all creative stuff, it's not marketing strategy and, and therefore, you know, it, it can almost annoy you a bit and apologies for, for those that have lots and lots of elements to campaigns and, and you, you're submitting all that stuff. But as I say, at the same time, if it's a terrific entry, it's it's clearly demonstrating excellence. Well, then it's obviously very helpful to have all of, all of the creative and and you know the the full package. I would say though, you know, what are we looking at mainly? We're looking at the the primary submission, not you know, and 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 the stuff, all the all the extras, the ads and the and the executions, etc., are very useful in supporting the story. But the the primary focus should really be on the main submission um, and the way it's laid out, how things are presented, and the words around it. Um, Joe, to answer the question on whether you should focus more on the on the visuals or more on the on the on the words, I don't really have an answer to that. I mean, I think it's they're equally important. Um, if I was to put an investment in in each direction, I'd probably say 50-50. You need a good story. You need to present things clearly, concisely. It needs to be well laid out, and you need to have you know enough graphic stuff in there to tell the story. But I also 
do do preface that by saying if, if it's a if it's a smaller organisation that's entering and they don't have the budget or the capability to do flash graphics, basically just an entry that tells the story well and is well laid out um, is absolutely fine. And you know we've had winners that have, to be honest, submitted pretty simple stuff. You know it's it's been a few charts of their success and it's been a picture or two and 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 not much else, but it's really been a, a great campaign for what they were capable of of funding, achieving its excellence in marketing, and, and they've won. Mm. So as I say, it's, it, we, we try to keep keep it available to everyone and, and, and keep a clear focus on, on judging marketing excellence, not, not budget sizes and fireworks. Mm. There we go. Sarah, any questions we should be handling from the audience? Um, we did have a question about entry tips. So I thought maybe let's move on to the, okay. the summary tip slide. Um, and then if there are any additional tips the panelists have to add, that would be fabulous. So hopefully what we've been saying um, <laughs> is, is supported by the top entry tips you see there. Um, certainly that's, uh, that's been compiled based on feedback from judges and from winners. So uh, but happy to take questions on, on any of that. Um, and while people digest all of those points, um, Lynette, anything else from your side? Uh, yeah, I think it's um, really important to consider what category you're entering into, uh, especially with marketing now. There's so much integration as well. And I know that we spend a lot of time um, at Bayer for the campaigns that we believe should go forward. Looking at those criteria, uh, sorry, those categories that the AMI have put together, and really what is it that we want to focus on for the entry. So we won an Insights, Customer Insights Award last year and that was really based on, even though there was a great engaging campaign and it possibly could have gone into other categories, we really felt that it was the Insights piece that really stood out. So that's the advice I give to people. It takes some time sometimes to work out the right category. Yeah, exactly right. Um, please, though, as I say, from a judging perspective as well, I, I alluded to this earlier. Ensure the fit, because you know, from a, from a judging perspective, you're really judging, for example, digital marketing. If if there's a campaign submitted that's five percent digital and and the rest is just you know uh, using a whole lot of other tools, etc., you're probably best putting it in another category. Um, and there will be one, for example, if it's a, if it's a Business to consumer comms campaign that's got digital elements. Put it in B two C ahead of ahead of anything else. Um, and, and as I say, if you want any advice, the AMI is also available to talk you through the various categories. Um, I would also say sometimes it does. Success can also depend on the competitors. So if you've got if you've hit on a category where we don't have a lot of awards. Um, you may stand out, whereas other categories can be very crowded and have, have a high proportion of excellent submissions. And um, it, it is a bit sad and, and frustrating sometimes to be judging a category or judging multiple categories where one category is stacked with fantastic, award, fantastic submissions. You need to pick a winner. And another category might, might be a bit short of fantastic submissions and, and you feel that the, the three or four fantastic submissions that weren't the best in, in the category that's, that's crowded are not actually in uh, the category that's not very crowded. But as I say, that's, that's often the way the cookie crumbles and um, it's also down to, I suppose, a bit of luck. Um, but as I say, I would, I would also preface all of that by saying do, do select the category that, that fits or, ca or multiple categories that fit. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight this year that we've got a new and improved awards platform um, and that we've got some additional um, sort of offers for member and non-member entries. So members receive a complimentary ticket to the state awards functions and non-members receive three months complimentary membership. Um, we've had a question as well about why the state awards are now after the national awards. The reason for that is that we found it's a great um, end of year networking event to have. It gives the networking events a bit of purpose. Um, and it's a great reason to gather and celebrate the end of the year along with the successes of the people who have uh, done well in the awards. Um, we've had another question, uh, where can I find examples of previous winning entries? That is a tough one because as Sean said, we do have strict uh, confidentiality um, 
so agreements in place. Um, so the best thing to check is um, our uh, media release library. Um, we do have information about the winning campaigns there. And finally, um, from Cassandra, are there rules around layout, word count, um, and the amount of collateral um, that can be included? Yes, there are. Um, and those details are most easily accessible on the website, um, which is at the bottom of all the slides. So it's ami.org.au slash 2015 awards. Um, if there are any final questions, uh, please type them now. Um, otherwise, it would be great. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill in the survey. Um, it's really important, um, your feedback to us, and we'll use that to improve our processes in future. Um, we're also wondering if anyone has tried the platform so far um, it would be great if you could put any feedback that you've got on the platform in the um, text box there. Um, but just a massive thank you to Sean, um, our head judge, Jane Clark of V Marketing, Lynette of Bayer, and Joanne of Icon PR. It's really, I really appreciate that you've joined us today. And thank you everyone on the line for joining us. I hope you've taken away some new ideas and tips to show off your campaigns. Um, just wanted to check if we've got any last questions. No. So for any um, further information, please see our website or you're welcome to email awards at ami.org.au. Sorry, I'm just trying to get that slide up. Um, and then the last thing I just want to say is um, please join us for our next webinar. We've got one coming up uh, next week on the 5th of May. Um, it's about marketing compliance and how you can protect yourself um, your brand, your corporate image by understanding the risk and exposure advertising can create. So do you know what drip pricing is? What about advertising? Have you heard about the ACCC investigations into the bake today, sold today claims um, and wondered what it's about? This is definitely for you. So check it out at ami.org.au slash webinars. Thanks again for participating. Thank you.